Now, I thought I had a plan, uh, and then Keith uh, Poole got on a rant, and so it <laughs> threw me off entirely. Uh, but I'll forge ahead in any case. Uh, I really think it's been a productive morning and really quite interesting. Uh, uh, I, I want you to think of this as a break from the serious stuff. Uh, this is kind of a luncheon schmooze. Think of it like a Daryl Issa oversight here. <laughs> <laughs> Bombastic, contentious, accusatory, unrestrained by facts and evidence. Uh, <laughs> Actually, I hope it's not as bad as that, but some of you may feel I stray a bit too far from the scholarly terrain of, of this conference and sound too much like a, like a, uh, a Washington pundit, one whose self-confidence greatly outweighs his knowledge and, and understanding. But give me a break. I mean, I've lived and worked in Washington for 45 years, it's bound to have some impact on me. Uh, and Keith Poole set the stage for it. So here goes. Um, a few months ago, the Monkey Cage commissioned uh, uh, and published a series of short essays on polarization, kicked off by an overview written by Keith's uh, collaborator, Nola McCarty which summarized the findings of an APSA group on which Francis and Mo and I, among others, uh, uh, served. Uh, I think Nolan fairly reflected the majority views of polarization within the, the scholarly community. And then what followed uh, in the ensuing days and weeks was a rich offering of research perspectives of, of colleagues, many of whom are participants in this conference uh, today, of, of some of the most interesting work on polarization that's being done. Um, much of that work is, uh, is being discussed, of course, here today. What I would like to do today and address with you is uh, is what I see as our professional discomfort and reluctance to take seriously uh, widespread public views that our system is dangerously broken. I understand, sympathize with that posture, one I've embraced most of my professional life. I've spent decades in Washington explaining and defending the American constitutional system in the face of what I considered to be an uninformed and ill-considered attacks on our way of, of governing. Um, I'm reevaluating that in light of the last session. The problems our country confronts are immensely difficult. Other democracies are struggling as we are trying to deal with them, we've overcome similar periods of subpar performance and, and political dysfunction throughout our history. And, and our political system somehow has managed to adapt to new circumstances and self-corrected itself. So I think our instinct, our instinct is to say, calm down. Let's relax. Uh, there's nothing here we really haven't seen before. Uh, but I want to I want to contest my earlier self, and uh, certainly not all of us, uh, and certainly not all of you. Um, but but I do think that there's something natural that goes on. How do we justify ourselves if we don't contest? the conventional wisdom of mere pundits or journalists. We have a positive political science uh, to conduct and are properly critical of half-baked diagnoses and ungrounded 
normative speculations on how best to cure our governing maladies. Now, I believe these times are strikingly different from what we've seen in the past. And the health and well-being of our democracy is properly a matter of great concern. Now, that sounds a little goo-goo, doesn't it? You know, it makes us instinctively uncomfortable. Uh, let it be said that in the battles of uh, party reform, I was always a regular and not a reformer. So this doesn't, this doesn't come naturally to me. It, uh, you know, it, it's years of observation and work, participation in Washington, um, I think, and the reality of what I'm seeing and confronting that leads me to it. It seems to me we owe it to ourselves and to the country to reconsider our priors and at least entertain the possibility that, that these concerns are justified. Let's start with some basics. Uh, and this is easy stuff. Uh, the parties in Congress are as polarized, that is internally unified and distinctive from one another as any time in history. Uh, uh, this holds for both the House and the Senate and most state legislatures. This partisan polarization in elite politics is matched in the electorate. Uh, uh, we can, in that sense, we can talk about how that came to be. We can talk about the likely arrow of causation from elites to a mass public in, in developing it, but there's simply no denying it, uh, uh, it's true. Uh, second, the fit between ideology and party is unusually strong. Hans Noel is, is here, I'm pleased to say. I had a wonderful opportunity to read and comment on his book uh, last week. I actually read it before I commented on it. <laughs> it's political ideologies and political parties in, in America. It's a, it's a rich and, and subtle book and argument, and I don't want to caricature it, Hans, but he argues that for the first time in American history, uh, even including the the late 1800s, the last Gilded Age, the post-Reconstruction Congress, the two dominant ideologies have captured the two dominant political parties. We've had equal degrees of, uh, of political polarization, of partisan polarization, but the, the reduced dimensionality uh, uh, and it leaves Hans, uh, who tracks really very interestingly the, where do the ideologies come from and how do they find their way to parties and ultimately to citizens uh, very carefully. He argues it's different. Now, if he's right, and it's debatable, but if he's right, wouldn't we think that might have some impact on our, on our politics, on our way of governing? I mean, it's not just something that we see, it's potentially something we've never seen in this form before. Number three, under divided government and split party control, the current Congress has ceased to operate as a legislative body. Deliberation and compromise are scarce commodities, no longer the coin of the realm. Uh, in that sense, I sympathize with, uh, with Keith. I just get, it's, it sickens me to listen to uh, the spin coming from party leaders in lieu of any kind of uh, realistic substantive debate. The contemporary Congress bears little resemblance to the textbook Congress, the so named by Ken Shepsley, as I recall, or to the reform Congress that followed. Individual members are no longer useful unit of analysis for understanding congressional behavior and policy making. Wow, there goes a lot of theorizing. Uh, 
parties are the dominant players uh, in Congress. Number four, public approval of the performance of Congress and public <coughs> trust in government to respond to their needs have, have plunged to record lows. And if the, the, the Kennedy School uh, latest study on the millennial generation is such, uh, uh, the new levels of trust coming into the electorate are even lower than those uh, that, uh, that are there now. So the trend line is, uh, is not very good. In the midst of all of this, we have the set of issues that Keith raised in his presentation. Um, we have huge uh, economic inequality, and we are partly from simple observation, partly from research, beginning to worry more and more about, about the political inequalities that, that flow from it and that reinforce, uh, uh, reinforce those economic inequalities. I think what I've just said are not controversial assertions. I'd even call them facts. Uh, they're that straightforward. Now, now on to some more disputed areas of the polarization story. The most important and problematic feature of today's polarization is its partisan character. Uh, to dismiss polarization as mere sorting is to miss the biggest and most significant development in American politics in my lifetime. That polarization reflects the striking ideological differences evident most sharply in the behavior of officials at national and state levels and among party activists, but also clearly evident among voters. Now, the, we've had discussion about this this morning. The linkage of party and ideology has given us more responsible parties. And with that, the promise of more clarity and accountability for voters. That certainly was the aspiration of Schott-Snyder and, and his colleagues in penning the 1950 uh, report. But we always have to remember the Descent from the Floor, written by none other than Austin Ranney, one of the truly wise uh, people in our, in our profession. Austin argued that parliamentary style parties in our constitution, constitutional system is a formula for gridlock and inaction. It's a disaster waiting to happen. And guess what? Uh, he was right, uh, and that's where we are. So it's, of course, somewhat more polarized, distinctive parties is a good thing. It does help uh, voters. It potentially can improve accountability. But you put it in our governing system, and, and it really can be a formula for gridlock and dysfunction. But partisan polarization reflects much more than sincere ideological differences. The rough parity between the parties fuels an intense competition for control of the White House and Congress. We, Alan certainly discussed uh, that this morning. Uh, the stakes are particularly high because the ideological differences between the vast party networks are large, and the chances of gaining or maintaining control, control are, are realistic because of the competitiveness of, of the parties. This leads to strategic voting. What Francis Lee developed uh, in a unique way uh, and calls partisan team play on, on non-ideological issues, leading to an expansion of a permanent campaign into an unending partisan war in governing, and a tribalism that is now such a prominent feature of American politics. Uh, Alan and Mark, I think your, 
your notion of affective uh, polarization uh, is real. Uh, it's palpable in Washington. You can't, if, if he was for it, uh, if he's for it, I'm against it, even if I was for it uh, six months ago. Um, uh, one defines one position by one's adversary, and we're talking adversary here. These are, these are not just uh, competing debating clubs. These are, these are actors engaged in warfare with real stakes and, and, and fundamental mark worldviews and values uh, uh, at, at stake that uh, uh, that are absolutely, uh, absolutely critical. So, uh, Sean, I think I'd argue that, that in fact, partisan polarization and the kind of political warriors are, are two sides of the same coin or a hand and a glove, that the, the strategic behavior is occasioned by the incentives that develop partly beginning with the, the clear ideological differences uh, between the parties and, and the change in party control of the White House and Congress and in, in, various, uh, in various state governments. So it, it goes from ideological polarization to strategic partisan team play to a level of tribalism now that is just breathtaking. Um, no one is more astounded by it than former Republican members of Congress uh, who simply don't recognize, uh, uh, recognize their, their party. Uh, not exclusively Republican. There are Alan Grayson's uh, in the world, but uh, you know, we're talking maybe 10 to 1, 20 to 1. Which leads me to my next point. And I'm so happy to see the reinforcement and evidence uh, backing, backing up uh, a proposition that, frankly, is one that uh, Keith and his colleagues made uh, years ago and substantiated uh, very clearly. And, that, and that's been apparent for a long time. The polarization is asymmetric. Republicans have become a radical insurgency. These words might ring a bell. Ideologically extreme, contemptuous of the inherited policy regime going back a century to Roosevelt, and I don't mean Franklin. Uh, we're talking Teddy. Scornful of compromise, unpersuaded by conventional understandings of facts, evidence, and science, and dismissive of the legitimacy of its political opposition. I mean, that last one is, is big time. That's serious. We, in some ways, we thought we had that worked out in the election of 1800. I mean, it was, it was touch and go. We had an imperfect constitutional provision for electing the vice president. It was long and painful. But the Federalists stepped aside and recognized the uh, the right to govern of the opposition party, that they too were Americans. Uh, but that is no longer the case uh, uh, within, uh, within the Republican Party. Mark's paper discussed uh, the, uh, the, the increasing tendency for Republicans to, to reject science and, and uh, facts, evidence, and what's What's most scary is that it was most evident among educated uh, and sort of politically interested uh, Republicans, not a function of uh, simply inattention or, or lack of knowledge. Uh, now, I believe the evidence of this asymmetry is overwhelming. Uh, we start with uh, Poole and Rosenthal, and McCarty, Poole and Rosenthal for members of Congress. Um, uh, they've laid it out carefully. Their measures are of political polarization, but they manage over time to, uh, 
to show how the dimensionality of that <laughs> conflict reduces to uh, a broad liberal conservative uh, one and uh, develop a procedure of finding links between Congresses to, uh, 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 through continuing members uh, and new members to, to really begin to give us some confidence that we're measuring something that's real. And the evidence that Keith presented here today on, on the polarization story of, uh, at least among elected officials, is, is pretty clear. This is something Gary's written uh, a lot about. The, the change within the Democratic Party was almost entirely a function of the replacement of conservative white Southerners by minority voters. The change among Northern Democrats is imperceptible over this, uh, over this time period. The real changes have, have occurred within the Republican Party coalition. It's a, it's a fascinating story of, uh, of how it happened. Hans's book offers some <coughs> unique perspective uh, on, uh, on this, uh, adding, adding to it, but it's, it's not to be dismissed out of hand as, you know, well, both parties, you know, are implicated. And that's where I take Keith on. I think he's given up too early. And, and uh, I don't think you can make the inference that you made about it's all hopeless. They're both bought and sold by Wall Street. Uh, uh, and therefore, the best thing to do is withdraw. Or at least that's my personal choice. I'm, I'm tempted at times to withdraw. Uh, and maybe we'll, we'll end up doing it. But I think the the evidence suggests something else. And now Alan and Gary and Mark have demonstrated uh, uh, that this very much touches the public as well. They have, over a period of time, sorted themselves and then come to hold with, uh, with strong attachment and fervor the views that are sent to them by their party leaders. John Zoller has changed his mind on a range of things, but one of them is not the importance of elites in structuring, uh, structuring public opinion. But the public is there now. Uh, it's not starting from fresh. Uh, uh, we don't get to have a, a, a Rawlsian veil of ignorance. I mean, we've, and we have latent opinions that provide real constraints on, on party elites or candidates who would try uh, to move in a different direction. Uh, there are many reasons to believe they will fail. Um, uh, and there are enough examples of that. Certainly, many of the Republicans in Congress who were, who were among the most serious of legislators in the Senate and the House have have come to believe that. We have evidence from party platforms and pledges, taxes, immigration, health care, race, same-sex relations, climate change, programs for low-income voters. There, there has been a shift away from a, a sort of a policy, if not consensus, but agreement uh, uh, that is, is really quite striking. And Republican leaders <coughs> regularly espouse views that are really quite stunning. If you look seriously at Paul Ryan's budget and how he balances it and who pays for it, it's stunning. But among, among the Republicans he's responding to, it, uh, it's a plus, not a minus. We've seen differences in strategies and tactics. I would compare the beginning of the Bush administration to the beginning of the Obama administration. Democrats actually provided votes to, uh, to pass a number of, uh, of uh, Bush initiatives. Uh, uh, the day of Obama's inauguration, the strategy was outlined. Absolute parliamentary style opposition. After the, the Republicans took control of the House, uh, the plan was outlined the year before in Young Guns. Uh, it's all about hostage taking with the debt ceiling and government shutdowns. 
and a strategy of nullification with the Affordable Care Act and a range of other policy that actually managed to pass that we haven't seen uh, uh, since the, uh, the years before the Civil War in the South. It also is a consequence of the grander ambitions of the Republicans than the Democrats. Democrats chastened by some of their, the cost of extreme behavior in the 60s and 70s are looking, uh, are looking to preserve uh, and to adapt uh, a social safety net and a government that has some capacity to act. Um, uh, sort of Republicans are looking to really replace it in some pretty fundamental uh, way. So it's easier in that sense for, for Democrats to be less extreme. I then give you the books and recommend uh, Jeffrey Cabot Service, uh, Mike Lofgren, uh, uh, Jonathan Haidt, and these guys called Mann and Ornstein who try to lay out some of the evidence. And, and I think if if you're going to dismiss the asymmetry argument, the burden is now on you to demonstrate why that's not uh, true. There, there are now sort of serious arguments that the Republican Party is the most extreme major, major party in the democratic world. Uh, the embrace of the Tea Party has has moved it further to the right, and the skirmishes uh, now underway are mainly over the style of which kind of candidate can get elected rather than what the policy differences are. I haven't found any between the Republican establishment and, and the Tea Party. The base is in, is in the white rural South, and there, it's all rooted in the contrasting worldviews uh, defined by Mark or <coughs> other people in terms of, uh, of some values. Yet, many political scientists, like most mainstream journalists, and political reformers refuse to even acknowledge or take seriously the case for this assertion. It makes us uncomfortable if we frame an argument that some will characterize as partisan even if it more accurately captures the reality of the contemporary party system. We, as well as mainstream media, do a public disservice to say less than we believe to be true and avoid research directions that might produce, quote, unbalanced uh, results. I saw, is Janet still here? Janet Hook uh, from the Wall Street Journal was here earlier. I spoke with one of her colleagues yesterday called me up um, about sort of history of oversight actions in light of the new proposal for a Benghazi uh, uh, investigation. And so I spoke frankly about some of this stuff. But I said, you're not going to write it. Your editor uh, wouldn't consider letting you say it even if you believed it. He said, well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, uh, and, it, and it really is true. And, we managed to produce many volumes on polarization without talking about the two parties and uh, how, they might, uh, how they might be different. Uh, next point, apart from the substantial minority of citizens who never vote and whose lives are fully detached from politics and public affairs, we are indeed a red and blue <laughs> nation. Allen's characterization of the current era of electoral competition is, in my view, dead on. Intense two-party competition for control, increasing one-party domination of states and congressional districts, and consistency of election results across levels and over time. I would argue that's precisely what Gary has, uh, has, has said as well. Now, it turns out that much of what we've written about parties in Congress doesn't fit contemporary conditions. Seth Maskett and, and Hans and John Zoller and other colleagues uh, uh, from UCLA have theorized and, and demonstrated in some circumstances that parties are less 
collectives of election-minded politicians responding to the median voter, then networks, including interest groups, activists, and donors with clear policy demands, as well as party and elected officials. It's a, it's a very different composition. The units of analysis, uh, when simply individual members to voters in constituencies doesn't begin to capture the, the politics that, uh, that are involved and how it is we came to have such extraordinary uh, match between uh, ideology and partisanship. And of course, districts voting for presidential and House candidates of different parties are vanishing. So too are states with US senators representing both parties, divided party government today is a formula for inaction, not an opportunity for bipartisan legislating. That may see, seem a truism, but then it's time to revise divided we govern and, and other writings about, there's nothing natural uh, about those being periods for useful cross-party collaboration, uh, but there are antecedents to it, requirements in the and the whole logic of partisan polarization as we've developed it, render those arguments about divided government simply no longer useful. Okay, so I conclude there's no reason to be smug about our past research findings or certain that we've seen it all before. There's plenty of evidence that suggests we have a serious mismatch between our responsible parties and our constitutional system, especially when one of those parties is hell-bent on replacing, not amending to fit current conditions, a century's worth of policy development. But we also know from our research that there's no easy way out of the mess we're in. Uh, what do we do? Well. We've got these new parties and there's something good about them. Why don't we change our institutions to fit these new parties? Oh, there's a good idea. Well, uh, we're not gonna have a parliamentary system and we probably wouldn't want one if we could have one. Um, yeah, we can play around with the filibuster, but that doesn't do much good. Uh, when you don't control, a president doesn't control the majority, uh, majority <coughs> in the, in the Senate, um, uh, I think, and I've been to a number of conferences, mostly run by law professors, that uh, that constitutional reform is that remains far fetched, and it's likely to remain in the realm of intellectual debate. Okay, scratch that. Uh, why don't we alter the electoral system to produce somewhat less polarized parties? Not non-polarized, just somewhat less. Um, certainly we can do something about that. And, and Mike McDonald made an argument. There's, there's things to do about primaries, but he, boy, he's up against a body of uh, research by Seth and Boatwright and, and others that suggest, uh, uh, suggest there's less there than, uh, than meets the eye, that they interact with other dynamics that prevent, quote, more moderate alternatives emerging. It's not over yet, it's worth, it's worth paying attention to, it's worth states experimenting. We ought to be there, uh, setting up good research and trying to draw some conclusions uh, uh, from it, but the most, the ideas that really might have some traction in dealing with the problem, like compulsory voting or, or a German-style system of compensatory at-large uh, representatives uh, or multi-member districts uh, you know, with preference voting, these, these are something that uh, are as far-fetched uh, and sometimes actually include constitutional reform as well. Sh should we try to reform redistrict redistricting? You betcha. But we don't go into it with a mind toward, toward solving our polarization problem. We just limit one of the consequences of it. That, that is, 
that is to say politicians are driven to maximize their advantage because they can. Um, and if they can't, it'll be a little better. Um, uh, but that's about uh, the extent of it. Uh, wishful thinking about independent or third party candidates appealing to a vast moderate center in American politics. I'm not real encouraged by that one. Um, in fact, I think it's a definite non-starter, given what we know about, about the electorate uh, and given what we know about how difficult it is to change, uh, to change the signals that, frankly, as Hans demonstrates, been developing for decades uh, uh, and, and can't be changed by uh, 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 David Walker or John Huntsman running as a third party or independent uh, <laughs> candidate. There's even more, and John, forgive me for this, even more wishful thinking about, about delegation to nonpartisan or bipartisan groups. It's good. We can put together some hellaciously smart policy proposals with former members of both parties gathered together. Uh, but none of them go anywhere uh, because they have no place in this in this arena, and, and I think that's why all of the emphasis on the bipartisan budget uh, commissions were, uh, were really beside the point. Perhaps the most promising are approaches that try to focus directly on the situation we face. What might nudge the Republican Party into a genuinely conservative, not radical party? One a little more pragmatic and a little less ideological, one that uh, has at least some modicum of, uh, of uh, willingness to accept some policy analysis, uh, one that aspires to win presidential as well as congressional elections over the long haul. How can we do that? <coughs> well, a few more decisive presidential election defeats might help, but as we know, we've got, we sort of gotten ourselves into a, you know, the beloved divided party government situation where a combination of factors, including a Democrat in the White House uh, and the distribution of Republican voters across districts and, and states has, uh, has made it unlikely to overcome that Republican control. It could happen in a landslide and 2016, I wouldn't bet a whole lot on it uh, right now. Um, so the arguments made between those concerned about presidential elections and congressional elections are two worlds uh, within, the, within the Republican Party. How about new conservative ideas less detached from a reality that might eventually seed a new Republican Party coalition? That's a long-term project, but I think a somewhat more promising one. And for those of you who read the, the national interest or at least consult with it, there are people trying to do uh, just that, to sort of try to bring their proposals somewhere, somewhere closer to the reality, to the facts and the evidence, but still reflect the values and interests that they have. We need it. Uh, but whether there'll be any market for this uh, uh, is, another, is another question entirely. How about another run of unified Republican party government? One that isn't discredited like George W. Bush's by unpopular wars and a financial collapse and finds its way to a politically and substantively sustainable program for governing. That's, perhaps that's more promising than, uh, than redistricting our, or primary reforming our way out of, uh, uh, out of the mess we're in. I, I admit to you, I don't know what the answer is, or even if there is one, um, but I do know, uh, in spite of a lot of terrific research, we still have more work to do to fully diagnose our strikingly dysfunctional government. And, and we have a greater responsibility 
uh, to say what we find and know and take the heat from it uh, if accused of, uh, of partisan bias and to put all the pressure we can on, on newsrooms uh, to not fall prey to false equivalents. Uh, uh, some of the newer uh, media outlets, uh, Vox, uh, uh, The Upshot, uh, some of the better blogs actually aspire to do that, of sort of somehow clearing away the, the banal uh, surface of arguments that have almost no connection to reality and, uh, and try to help people uh, understand what's going on and what the stakes are, but there's no evidence that that will succeed given what we know about voters and who they take cues from, but I think that's what we're left with. Being honest about what's wrong, trying to be clear about how it happened, and, and uh, to, be, uh, to be modest in, uh, uh, in our suggestions of what might uh, be done to overcome it. Thank you. Um, we have time for a few questions. Would you like a few from the audience? Sure. <laughs> Gary. Tom, when you're looking at, at long-term prospects, when you're looking at long-term prospects, you didn't mention demography. And I've been looking at demographic yeah, data yeah. recently, and it, it's really quite stunning that uh, people who've come of age since the Clinton administration are far more democratic than the previous generations by, by you know, 15 right. point gap. Right. Uh, and if people are imprinted uh, in their party ID at the time they become politically active, as some of the theory suggests, then the long term prospect is that, that uh, the, the, the crazy wing of the Republican Party is going to shrink uh, to be a very small part of the population within you know, 15 or 20 years. It's not an instantaneous thing. Yep. Uh, no, you're absolutely right. I didn't discuss that, although implicitly I, I was referring that, to that when I talked about those thinking about how the Republican Party can win a presidential election again. It, uh, I mean, Allen's tables laid that out as clear as can be. The march of, uh, of the electorate over time, which, which uh, includes the uh, the minorities uh, that are growing, it, uh, the younger cohort, uh, uh, other groups that are growing, like uh, like highly educated, uh, living in in high tech regions and uh, in metropolitan areas, unmarried women, um, uh, people with uh, less uh, of a religious commitment. I mean. It's certainly tolerance on same-sex marriage and others. You just see a sort of range of things that if you were just looking at the demographics, you'd say, listen, a political party we've been taught is, is one that is pragmatic. They want to win elections, and therefore they will make the adjustments they can. Well, that isn't necessarily true given other, other conditions, but I think it would take quite a a transformation and where I'm talking, that's where I was talking about sort of new ideas uh, uh, that might help reshape uh, uh, the Republican Party coalition. Some imagine a sort of libertarian thrust. I, I think there's less there than meets the eye, but we'll, you know, we'll see. I don't think it's, a, it's really a practical program for satisfying voters and, and governing successfully, but uh, uh, but one never knows. But it does hold out the opportunity, and I, I should have laid that out more explicitly, uh, which is uh, a Democratic Party that's uh, assuming the economy actually uh, continues its uh, halting recovery, uh, winning, winning no longer landslide elections, but comfortable elections at the presidential level, Gain, holding or regaining the Senate and, uh, and coming close in the House. Uh, the effects of redistricting wear off as we get later into the decade. And, and if they did that and then dramatically reformed uh, uh, the filibuster further, uh, uh, using the so-called 
nuclear constitutional option, I could imagine uh, a program of governing put in place. It's not a radical one. It would have been one embraced by Republican moderates a generation ago, but a, a program that's at least responsive to the problems uh, that we face. I'm not as disheartened as Keith that, that the Democratic and Republican Party have sold out to, to Wall Street and, and the, the, the billionaires. It, it turns out you're right. There are Democratic and liberal billionaires just like Republican ones. And, and uh, Wall Street has invested a lot in Democratic candidates. And I'm even more appalled at, at Gebhardt than you are. Uh, so there's a lot to be disgusted with. But there remain profound differences between the parties on these very matters. And if you look at surveys of uh, hedge fund managers, it's, it's about four or five to one Republican. If you look at big money, and maybe I even took this out of a Bonica uh, 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 piece, it's, it's probably 60-40 as far as uh, donations from, uh, from the super wealthy. So I, I do think there's room for change and governing and getting things done. And if that happened and, um, and Democrats grew a larger and more stable coalition, they then would begin to fracture, have some uh, temptations to move uh, further left and run into troubles, but at least it would give us a, a respite from this current period of, uh, of governing. And I would say that outcome is, uh, is as, uh, you know, as, uh, has about as good a chance or better than any of the others I mentioned. We have time for one more question. I'm sorry, we're sort of out of time. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, uh, what, what, uh, I don't know if anybody's going. I don't know if anybody's going into this much because I'm not familiar enough with the literature, but I have this perception that the Republican Party is really not like the Democratic Party in the sense that uh, they're sort of like the European uh, far right uh, parties. In other words, they're, they're basically there to stir things up. Uh, and uh, I wonder what your <coughs> thought of, about that idea is. And secondly, um, I, with, with this uh, coming new demographic on the horizon, uh, I, I'm, I personally am opposed to either or solutions. So I'm thinking about maybe it's time we thought about a way of approaching these things which would capture the short-term things that you're talking about, but also look long-term for major change, major reform. So, Yeah, I, I mean, that's not true historically of the Republican Party. No. I think in recent, uh, in recent years, it, it has become more extreme. Uh, it's a much sharper ide ideological profile, a less less of an inclination to, uh, uh, to go against any positions or principle. Compromise is bad. If the other party is for it, we have to be against it because they are evil personified. So it's a combination of uh, ideology, strategic voting, and tribalism that puts the Republican Party where they are. And they are distinctive now. And, uh, and that's a great source of uh, our problems. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.